attending the International Myeloma Work uh, Community International Myeloma Foundation Regional Community Workshop. Today, you're going to find uh, that you're going to get a lot of information, and I'd like you to understand that we're here to help you do what you guys need, but let's do it in a civilized way. My name is Kelly Cox, and I've been with the foundation for 20 years. I'm a senior director of these regional community workshops. We put them on across the country, and we're thrilled to be doing this one in the Great Lakes. We have been in operation for 30 years. Can you go to the next slide, Mira? And one of the things we offer on all of our programs is a replay. Now, I don't expect you to copy this whole URL down. We'll send you that after the program. Uh, you'll get another link to it if you send uh, via email. So although I'm asking you to keep a notepad and keep organized and keep your questions coming, just remember you can go back to these uh, 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 video presentations and see exactly what's going on. Next slide, please. Well, a lot of this couldn't happen, and we do several of these a year without the general support of our sponsors. And that's Amgen, Janssen, Binding Site, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cario Farm, Takeda and Oncology. Takeda Oncology. They have supported my programs for many, many years, and I'm glad to say that they have supported my hundredth, I said one hundredth RCW to date that I've been doing these. I have been thrilled to put these programs on. I've met so many good people, so many great doctors, and heard so many great programs. Let's go to the next slide, please. The person who's speaking is the guy on the left. That's me, Kelly Cox. You're going to hear from Craig Cole, MD, and uh, Agnes P uh, Panner, MD, and Amy Pierre. Well, she has a lot of acronyms after her name, as I always say, but she's an RN for sure. Let's go to the next slide. Here is, you'll see Craig Cole, I already did this, and Hank Panner and Amy Pierre. Go ahead and go past that. Next slide. Here's our agenda for today. They usually give me about 10 minutes, but I don't want to waste time today and talk to you about anything. You already know who the foundation is. We've celebrated for 30 years. We are here for the cure period. Now, with that being said, Craig Cole is going to go with a wonderful Myeloma 101 talk and frontline therapy. Even though you might have myeloma for several years or you've been dealing with it and you feel pretty confident about it, wait till you see Craig Cole's presentation. You'll learn much more than you ever thought, and you'll understand much more of the history of the science of this. Because Craig always says, it's the science. He'll also go into frontline therapy, and that's important for you guys having to make a decision what kind of treatment you want. After that, about 10.50 to about 11.05, we'll have questions and answer, answer sessions with the panel. So you just take your time and we'll answer your questions and make sure that uh, all this is correct and helpful for you. We'll do a little stretch, maybe go get a cup of coffee to wrap things up. And then we'll go into our second segment, which will be relaxed therapy and clinical trials. After that, we will, second page, next slide, please. We go into question and answering, and then we go into health in the COVID era. I'm already seeing questions about that, so stand by. You'll hear about that later in a very detailed sense, how it relates to a multiple myeloma patient. Then we'll have question and answers and with the whole panel, and we'll do closing comments, which I won't take a lot of your time. Two things I want you to remember. 800-452-2877. That's our info line, Monday through Friday, 9, uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then the toughest website you could ever find is myeloma.org. That's our, that's our URL. You cannot forget that, myeloma.org. Now, with all that being said, let's get into this thing and have some fun today. Craig, would you like to start, please? Uh, yes. Um, thanks, um, Kelly. And thanks to the IMF. And congratulations, Kelly, on your 100th um, RCW. And and really, you know, Kelly, you and the IMF have changed the complete landscape of, of myeloma um, with my patients and patients around the world. Um, I mean, we went from us doing talks where we're just get, you know, hoping that patients understood um, what a plasma cell was up until today, where already we're getting, you know, questions about neutropenia and COVID um, and the novel therapies and MRD 
And so really that is all a testament to the fantastic work that the IMF has done um, as it continues to inspire patients, families, and I am always stimulated and encouraged by what the IMF has done. So I thank you uh, very much for all that you've done. Um, so my name is Craig Cole, um, and I'm going to talk a, a bit about myeloma 101 and uh, frontline therapy, but how common is myeloma, the spectrum of plasma cell disorders. We'll talk about the diagnosis and some of the labs that we use to follow uh, myeloma. Then we'll talk about um, something that's important, um, staging and risk stratification of myeloma. Then we'll talk about, and that's the myeloma 101 part, then we'll talk about the upfront therapies, including treatment sequence and regimens, um, the upfront therapy strategies, some of the new information we're getting from the ASH meeting, uh, the American Society of Hematology meeting this year. We'll talk about some new things and some old things about bone support. Um, and then we're gonna talk briefly about the, the some of the really fantastic new data that's coming out on four drug induction therapies and then some perspectives. So, fast facts about myeloma. Second most common blood cancer. Um, lymphomas are the most common, so myeloma is the second most common. Um, that uh, 32,000 uh, new cases of myeloma. The incidence has been slowly rising. It's not a rapidly rising um, drug, but it, I mean uh, disease, but it's slowly rising in part because of improved um, detection of the disease. Um, there are 131,000 patients living with myeloma in the United States currently. Um, and it is frequently is a disease of true adults. Um, as I get older, I now understand that people in their 30s are still kids. Um, and true adults are um, uh, in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And that's where we most commonly see myeloma. And then something that's interesting, and actually I'll circle back on this, is that um, the ins that there's definitely a, a ethnic and racial um, um, uh, difference in the biology of myeloma. Um, and one little interesting point is that the incidence in, in blacks um, all around the world um, is higher than in whites. Um, about 12 per 100,000 for blacks in the United States, 5.2 for whites, um, and the same number for um, Hispanics, a little bit lower for Native Americans. And actually for people of Asian descent, it's 3.7 per 100,000. And we don't know why. Um, and we believe that it is connected to the biology of the disease, not so much in the way of, of, of social or economic or exposures. So common symptoms of myeloma, um, blood counts, low blood counts, anemia, low red blood counts, very common um, at the time of diagnosis. And that will have patients feeling fatigue, weakness, um, sometimes increased infection, um, decreased kidney function that the myeloma proteins can get stuck in the kidney, clogging up that filter um, in about half of patients causing weakness and fatigue. Um, the myeloma cells, which are usually dependent upon the bone marrow um, in order to grow and proliferate, will sometimes leave the bone marrow and go to the bones and then cause bone damage um, in the majority of patients. However, fractures are a bit more rare, but can occur in about 50% of patients. Of course, that can lead to, to bone pain. And then increased bone turnover, that these myeloma cells will again go to the long bones um, and take over the uh, calcium metabolism causing high calcium in the blood, which can cause confusion, loss of appetite, weight loss, and again, fatigue. And we usually, uh, what we use as the myeloma defining events or the, or the symptoms of myeloma, we um, use as the CRAB criteria or the CRAB symptoms, with C being hypercalcemia or high calcium level. The normal calcium is about 10, so over 11 is hypercalcemia. A decreased kidney function or renal function, where the serum creatinine, the higher that number, the lower the kidney function. So serum creatinine over two is worrisome for myeloma. Anemia, lower blood count, less than 10. And then bone disease, having lytic lesions on a skeletal x-ray 
or more sophisticated uh, um, screening tests for bone damage. Um, we usually call that the CRAB criteria. However, about 10 to 20 percent of patients with newly diagnosed no myeloma may not have any symptoms, and we'll talk about that about smoldering myeloma in a second. So in the spectrum of plasma cell disorders, MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, is when you have a low serum protein and the older um, a criteria was a M protein under three, um, with zero being normal. Plasma cells in the bone marrow are less than 10%. The normal is 1%. Um, in patients with MGUS, it needs to be less than 10% and no symptoms, including crab symptoms or the slim crab we'll talk about in a second. And that is a low risk of, of turning into multiple myeloma, about 1% per year. So it's a very low risk of turning into myeloma. And then there's smoldering myeloma. When the protein level is higher because there are more plasma cells in the bone marrow, between 10 and 60%. And again, with smoldering myeloma, there are no symptoms um, or signs that the myeloma is, uh, that those plasma cells are active. And that has a bit higher a percent of changing into multiple myeloma at 10% per year to become symptomatic myeloma. And there's a new category now um, that we call high risk smoldering myeloma, where, and we use the uh, two. 2020 um, um, new classification of, or I guess staging for smoldering myeloma. When the M protein is over two um, and the plasma cells in the bone marrow are over 20%, not 10%, um, and the free light chain ratio is over 20%. And when patients have all three of those, their risk of developing myeloma is higher. Um, uh, around a 40 a percent in two years. And also there are, um, we sometimes we call smoldering myeloma, high risk smoldering myeloma evolving type, where the M protein continues to increase and increase and increase heading towards uh, true myeloma. And again, this is without uh, the crab or slum crab high risk features. Um, and, there's, um, and there's been a lot of interest in high-risk smoldering myeloma, including a number of clinical trials exploring both the biology and the um, and treatment of high-risk smoldering myeloma. And true and true myeloma is um, when the there is a bone marrow biopsy um, that shows plasma cells or increased plasma cells over 10% or a um, plasma cytoma that's been biopsy plus one of the crab features that we have, have talked about, um, or the new, I guess not that new, um, since 2015, the slim crab criteria. So, um, and that is when the plasma cell percentage in the bone marrow is over 60%, or the free, free serum light chains are over 100, or the or there's one the more lytic lesion, um, or more than one lytic lesion on the MRI, and that group, that slim group, has a over 90% likelihood of, ha of developing symptoms of, multiple, of, of the crab symptoms in one, in one year um, or in two years. So we definitely treat the slim crab folks, even though they may not have any symptoms at the time of, of diagnosis. So again, for MGUS, we watch MGUS for smoldering myeloma. Um, again, they're clinical trials, but usually we are observe um, uh, smoldering myeloma because, again, the minority of, um, of patients uh, might develop myeloma. For high risk, this is a very interesting group. We, um, we usually have very close observation for high risk smoldering myeloma, but this is an active area of clinical trials. and. We're, and hopefully we'll be able to get more information on if we should treat high-risk smoldering myeloma or not. There are some clinical trials that suggest that, um, but really I think a lot of people still observe, closely observe high-risk smoldering myeloma to see if it is the evolving type. And then of course for true and true myeloma, um, multi myeloma, that we treat those with upfront therapy or, or clinical trials. Um, so it's important to know your labs. Um, that is, uh, gives you, um, empowers you to know what's going on with your body. 
So the CBC, um, with the, where we look at red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, the comprehensive panel, which looks at all the chemistry, including the creatinine, um, kidney function, and, um, and calcium level. The beta-2 microglobulin and the LDH are used for staging purposes only. The beta-2 is a protein that is on plasma cells and excreted by, uh, by myeloma cells and excreted by the kidney. So the higher the number of plasma cells, the lower the kidney function, the higher the beta-2. And the LDH is also using, is used for staging purposes. The lactate dehydrogenase, um, which is a chemical that is released from cells when they're rapidly reproducing. And again, we use that for staging purposes. And then there's kind of the meat of how the myeloma is doing. The serum protein electrophoresis tells us how much of myeloma is being, how much protein is being produced by the myeloma cells, which gives an idea for how many myeloma cells there are. The amino fixation tells us the type of protein being produced by the myeloma cells. The free light chains look for those fragments of protein, um, of monoclonal protein produced by the myeloma cells. Again, it tells us how much. And the urine tests um, are tests that I would love to talk about the history of this, of this test. It's 100, almost 150 years old but it looks at the how much myeloma of those light chains are being produced and excreted into the urine. So regarding the SPAP, um, this is what normal plasma looks like if you divide the plasma up by different weighted proteins. The gamma region has the heaviest proteins. The albumin at the, um, at the left side has the lightest proteins, and all those antibodies are in the gamma region. So if you have myeloma and you're producing a lot of antibody or protein produced by the myeloma cells, you'll have a tall spike uh, um, in the uh, gamma region. And you can quantify that spike to see how many grams are being produced by the myeloma cells. Because that monoclonal protein, the M protein, the more myeloma cells you have, the higher that protein will be. And that's important to know because when you're treating myeloma, when myeloma is being treated and the, my, and the plasma cells are reduced, the protein's being reduced because you don't want a bone marrow biopsy every time that you get treatment. So that M protein tells us how much myeloma cells are at the start and with treatment, how much have you gotten rid of? And it is good to get rid of myeloma cells. The free serum light chain same is uh, basically the same um, idea looking at those fragments of protein uh, produced by the myeloma cells. Normally, we have equal amounts of free light chains called kappa and lambda um, in our normal immune system. However, when pay, and the ratio between the two is one. However, if you have a monoclonal a light chain with either MGA, smoldering myeloma, or milk myeloma, one, and I've picked the kappa as the light chain that's increased, one of the light chains will be high, and the other one will be suppressed by the plasma cells, by those myeloma cells. And with treatment, what we would expect is that that uh, kappa light chain will go down back to normal and will restore the, the unaffected light chain back to normal, which will bring that ratio between the two from over 100 back down to 1. And that tells us that the treatment is, is working. Um, oops, so, oh no, it got way off. I'm sorry. Um, there's a little preview of what we're going to talk about. Um, and here we are. Sorry about that. I think I hit the button too many times. And next. Well, at least we know your trick of building slides. <laughs> the, well, the animation was, is fantastic. It really oh, is, Greg. So um, there we are. So um, so for intact, um, there are intact myeloma, um, IgG, IgA, either kappa or lambda. Um, that's the majority of myeloma patients have an IgG kappa or lambda, um, IgA kappa or lambda, um, sometimes IgD. However, about 20% um, of patients um, will have all light chain only myeloma. And again, those light chains can get caught in the kidney causing kidney damage. And then the minority of patients, less than 3% will have non-secretory myeloma where those plasma cells are so uh, mutated that they don't produce any light chains at all. Um, 
making the diagnosis that we um, have been doing x-rays for about 100 years looking at, for holes in the bones related to myeloma. Now we use PET scans um, frequently, if the, especially if the x-rays are negative, that's 85% more sensitive in picking up plasma, uh, picking up myeloma areas involved in the bone. And then, um, and then of course, the bone marrow biopsy, which if it's over 10%, is consistent with either smoldering or true and true myeloma. One way to understand the biology or the, or the mutations associated with myeloma is to do genetic testing, which is only on the plasma cells. And fish is our main way, for us it's in situ hybridization, is our main way looking at the uh, plasma cell uh, mutations that are, are present that cause the myeloma to occur in the first place. That's a very important task because it determines both the, uh, the stage and the risk associated with it. So I'll show you that right now. So here's a table um, really that, uh, that, is, uh, that every patient with myeloma should have cytogenetics done and the fish cytogenetics to assign their disease as standard risk or high risk. And I'll show you in a bit how we treat those two diseases um, differently or recommend different treatment. Standard risk is when um, the uh, patients have either a a, the, four, the 11th and 14th chromosomes stuck together, or they have more than one pair of chromosomes. Because usually, you know, um, we have one chromosome from mom, one chromosome from dad. But when those myeloma cells get mutated, sometimes that they'll acquire an extra uh, a pair, uh, an extra um, set of chromosomes um, in those plasma cells. There are other mutations or, or features that associate with standard risk. And of course, and normal is also standard risk. It's those high risk patients that really get our attention for both clinical trials and um, and uh, looking at different types of therapy because the high risk patients are more difficult to re to maintain in a remission for long periods of time. And so, and that's why it's important to recognize high risk myeloma. That is associated with deletions of the 17th chromosome gain of chromosome one, translocation of the four and 14th chromosome, 14, 16, 14, 20, or um, on genomic uh, testing um, on myeloma cells, looking for mutations in the P53 gene on chromosome 17. Um, very important to recognize that um, because it really does look at the staging. So the staging of myeloma, stage one is when you have a low beta to microglobulin, which means you don't have a lot of plasma cells. Um, and a normal LDH, the cells aren't reproducing very quickly, and no high-risk uh, side genetics by fish. Stage three is when you have a high beta to microglobulin, lots of plasma cells, or the kidneys aren't functioning well. Um, um, plus a high LDH, cells reproducing fast, or and or high risk cytogenetics. And stage two is when it doesn't fit for either one. Um, the, um, so how do we treat newly diagnosed myeloma in 2020? Well, we use, as Kelly had mentioned earlier, science. I hardly ever give chemotherapy for myeloma we use biologic therapy and therapy really developed using understanding the biology of myeloma and how to kill it biologically. And those drugs are the immunomodulatory drugs, thalidomide, revlimid, and pomelis, uh, proteasome inhibitors, velcade, and laro, and kyprolis, and antibodies directed against a myeloma immunotherapy, daratumumab, isatuximab, and elotuzumab. And then we have been blessed to have a number of new drugs with novel um, 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 ways of, of operation, including Selenexor, um, Blinorap, which I love both. I love, I love all these drugs because they've done such great work for um, improving and prolonging the lives of patients with myeloma. And there's much, much more to come. So the tools of the trade are, again, the immunomodulatory drugs, which are all oral, the proteasome inhibitors, the Velcade, Carpolis, and Enlaro, which are given either subcutaneously, especially Velcade, or IV um, in the way of, of Carfilzomib or Kyprolis, or pills uh, such as Nenlaro. We do use chemotherapy occasionally, um, especially during um, 
auto transplant that we'll use melphalan for auto transplant. Steroids, we're still dependent upon steroids to initiate the death cascade in those myeloma cells, uh, usually in the way of dexamethasone. And again, one of the newer players in upfront therapy are the monoclonal proteins um, or monoclonal antibodies where the immune, we get your immune system to destroy those myeloma cells. And oops, and there's to be an update to that. Now the monoclonal um, protein, uh, monoclonal antibodies, especially daratumumab, is available as a subcutaneous um, so, um, under the skin injection, as well as an IV intravenous infusion. And these are the, um, the sequence of, of how we treat active myeloma. We use upfront treatment, and I have listed a number of, of different regimens that we use to treat myeloma. You'll see that there's only, uh, that all the therapies I listed are three drug therapies. There was a clinical trial that was done by uh, Dr. Brian Dury, um, the, the president of, of the IMF, that looked at two drugs versus three drugs, RD, uh, RevDex versus Rev. Velcade decks and found that the that basically everything was better with using a three drug therapy. So now the standard is to use three drug induction therapy, followed by a consolidation regimen, usually stem cell transplant or continued uh, induction therapy, and then maintenance um, therapy. And again, um, usually Ravlimib, but we'll talk about the other maintenance therapies that we use. And then when patients relapse. There is a, a long list of different uh, therapies that we use, including you'll see clinical trials is listed in every one of the sections. So, newly diagnosed myeloma. Um, patients are either non -trans not transplant candidates or transplant candidates. Most patients are transplant candidates. If you have high risk, and this is from, I should mention, the MSMART guidelines. So the Mayo Clinic, um, I, I think that a lot of, of myeloma doctors, a lot of doctors around the world will look to the Mayo Clinic guidelines as a, a way to organize the uh, treatment of myeloma in both uh, newly diagnosed and relapsed myeloma. So for trans, so I've gotten these, and I do, I basically follow these guidelines with a couple little caveats that I'll mention. Um, but for non-transplant candidates, if you're high risk, difficult to maintain in a long-term response, we'll use RVD for 12 cycles in patients, again, non-transplant candidates, followed by Velcade maintenance, which has been shown um, years ago to improve the outcome in patients with high-risk myeloma as maintenance therapy. If you have standard risk myeloma, then either Rev, uh, um, Rev, Revlimid, Velcade, Dexamethasone, or newly approved uh, for um, non-transplant candidate myeloma, the daratumumab, that new antibody for myeloma, plus RevDex. And there are other uh, daratumumab, including regimens that can be given, um, usually for one year, followed by Rev maintenance. Again, most patients will be transplant candidates. Um, age is not a discriminator for if someone um, can receive a stem cell transplant, it's usually other health problems that will be discriminators from transplant to non-transplant candidates. If you have high-risk myeloma, then it really is important to get the deepest response possible as quick as possible. And either using the DARA um, RVD, adding the antibody to that three-drug regimen as a four-drug regimen, or using carfilzomib Revdex in a trial that was um, that was done, which wasn't a high risk, we did see that Rev, that uh, carfilzomib Revdex can induce deeper responses than RVD, which is again, uh, the extrapolations that, again, really important in high-risk myeloma. So you then go to early transplant uh, for high-risk myeloma, followed by Velcade maintenance. If you have standard-risk myeloma, then um, four cycles of RVD to get to a, a, a very good partial response or complete response, followed by transplant, um, followed by Rev maintenance, which is the um, preferred uh, regimen. However, um, I'll, oops, I will show you that, um, that there have been some recent data that shows that we can actually delay transplant in some patients um, and that the outcomes, I'll show you in a second, are very similar 
um, for overall survival between early transplant and delayed transplant, which is really important during COVID if we um, have to delay transplants because of the uh, pandemic. And so the goals of therapy, the iceberg model, when patients present with myeloma, that they'll have, it'll be obvious that they'll have myeloma, they'll have bone uh, lytic lesions, um, they'll be symptomatic. But as we go to, to, as we begin treatment, we'll reduce those plasma cells down from a, from a trillion down to a billion where patients will have 50% of their myeloma um, gone down to very good partial responses fewer myeloma cells, then it's not obvious that patients have myeloma. 90% reduction, that's when we usually uh, do a stem cell transplant. And then a complete remission is when there are no protein, that we cannot find any proteins in the blood. And astringents, when we do a bone marrow biopsy, and can't find any plasma cells. And investigational, um, um, and still, I think um, we hope will be standard of care. Um, will be, uh, and uh, someday will be minimal residual disease testing, either by flow cytometry and next generation um, sequencing or testing that will be able to detect minuscule um, amounts of myeloma or as, and as close to zero um, myeloma cells as possible. Um, that is, however, not quite the standard of care yet. So how do you get to those deep responses? Well, again, transplant. And I, I don't know anything about boxing, to be honest with you. But I know if you keep throwing a right hook like RVD, you're going to really hurt the guy. Um, he's really, this guy is kind of hurting. And to knock him out, so you're using right hook, right hook, right hook. And then myeloma is not suspecting that left hook, which is the chemotherapy stem cell transplant. You give that left hook and the guy is out, um, down on the mat. And then maintenance therapies like putting your neck on the, your opponent that has been knocked out to keep them down as long as possible. It's kind of morbid, but um, the way, you know, what we know about transplant um, was really highlighted in the um, IFM, the French Myeloma Group trial of 2019, where they got patients 65 or younger. They're 65 because that um, there is an age limit for transplant in Europe. Um, those patients were either they received um, either RVD as induction therapy with delayed transplant or RVD followed by transplant consolidation. And what's key is that they only received 12 uh, months of maintenance therapy. So the primary objective was to see how long it took for folks to relapse. Was there a difference between the two? However, it, maintenance was only continued for one year, um, which is not the standard. Um, the um, most patients that didn't get transplant, that had deferred transplant, actually got transplant when the time that they relapsed. So really, most of the patients that didn't get transplant ended up with transplant at some point, 76% of patients. This was then updated, um, um, is going to be updated at the ASH meeting that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, and the study was done before the use of modern therapy. So this was 2009 when the study was initiated. And so the results of the study were very interesting and very encouraging. So if you compare delayed transplant or RVD upfront um, versus upfront transplantation, RVD followed by transplant, definitely transplant um, wins for, for having lower blood counts, nausea and vomiting and infection. The, but however, this only occurs in the hospital. This only occurs in the hospital. So patients aren't at home having this. This is in a controlled manner in the hospital and is uh, then treated. So patients only have that transiently. Most important thing, the primary objective was to show that, um, that the time for relapse was longer. People stayed in their remissions longer with transplant than having RVD. And this is really important because that tells us that transplant will have you in a deeper remission and you maintain that longer with transplant than without transplant. When you receive, and this is the other important point that came up at the, coming up at the last ASH meeting, that the overall survival between the groups are equal. So even though patients stayed into a, re, a complete response longer, with upfront transplants, when they got it um, on relapse or delayed, it really didn't affect overall survival. 
really important point, especially in the COVID era. However, when you look at very good partial responses and MRD negativity, again, you get deeper responses and MRD negativity higher in transplant. Deeper responses, longer time to relapse, but it doesn't matter where you put the transplant, it just matters if you get the transplant. Um, and MR, um, MRD negativity was a strong predictor of overall survival and progression-free survival. Again, the deeper you can get on that iceberg, the deeper, longer it takes for the disease to come back. What to do after transplant? Well, the one of the largest American studies uh, for myeloma, um, the stamina trial, um, got patients uh, in the U.S. Um, that were newly diagnosed with myeloma. They also put an age limit on this trial. Um, but again, uh, for standard of care, there isn't an age limit. They were all given RVD or Cyborg D and one of the other regimens, followed by stem cell transplant. And then they're randomized to one of three groups because we didn't know which was the best one. Um, some patients went directly to relevant maintenance after transplant. Um, another group went to consolidation, more RVD after transplant, followed by a relevant maintenance and, or a second transplant. Because it was a US study, the relevant maintenance was continued on and um, uh, continued on until something I'll show you in a little bit. And basically what this study showed, very important study, that there was no difference in progression-free survival and overall survival in standard risk patients um, if they had two transplants, consolidation, or, or, or rev maintenance. So it just made sense for patients to go straight to rev maintenance after receiving a transplant because all the outcomes were the same. A recent, at the last ASCO meeting, there was, uh, it looked like that maybe the high-risk patients seemed to benefit from two transplants. However, earlier I showed you the high-risk patients, we usually use Velcade or proteasome inhibitor maintenance for those uh, groups of patients. And this study was, rev uh, they went to rev maintenance instead of a proteasome inhibitor. So I'm not sure if it's quite clear if we know that patients benefit from two transplants if they're high risk or not. I think we have to tease that out a bit further, hopefully in the future. Um, we do know that rev maintenance um, does have improved outcomes. There were four randomized trials way back in the day before we used rev maintenance of rev maintenance versus no maintenance um, involving two, uh, 2,000 myeloma patients. And the results showed that there were improvements in overall survival and in progression-free survival, but we still don't know. And the graph below shows all those trials and shows that there's a tendency for all those for improved outcomes with rev maintenance, which is why we use rev maintenance for everyone or some type of maintenance, I'm sorry, for everyone. The duration is unknown of how long we should continue. There are a lot of trials looking at that. And there are other maintenance uh, therapies, uh, including Velcade and Carfilzomib and Nanlaro also being looked at. One thing that came out of the stamina trial that was recently uh, released was that um, um, was that um, the patients were on that trial either given a choice to either stop their rev maintenance or continued on. And so at 36 uh, months, patients were e able to either stop or continue. And when patients have stopped, they, um, this graph shows that they did have a tendency to relapse early as compared to the continued route. So that told us that at 38 months, we really should continue on rev maintenance and that we still don't know the duration of how long we should do that. Bone support is very important um, that we give Zameda, um, permigenate in order to strengthen the bones to, um, uh, to decrease uh, bone, um, uh, bone uh, breaks, fractures, and improve quality of life. One recent thing that we saw is that has been published that vitamin D therapy actually improves uh, survival in myeloma patients, particularly in Caucasian patients, which again focuses on the biology difference between uh, the ethnicities of this disease. So we do recommend calcium and vitamin D therapy, but also um, we use uh, drugs to control pain um, and orthopedic support. I, we definitely engage our radiation therapy and, and, and physical medicine uh, consults in order to improve quality of life. So then briefly, I'll talk about the new stuff um, in myeloma. 
um, in upfront therapy. And a really exciting thing, um, and what I have just been thrilled about, is the Griffin trial data. So the Griffin trial, I got patients uh, that are transplant eligible for myeloma and randomized them between either RVD, the current standard, or adding that antibody, DARA RVD, um, for upfront therapy. So patients receive four cycles of induction therapy, either DARA RVD or RVD. They went to stem cell transplant. They then received a consolidation afterward um, for DARA RVD or RVD, and then went on either DARA Rev maintenance or Rev maintenance if they hadn't received DARA. Um, and the primary endpoint was um, deep responses um, to see those uh, um, stringent complete responses. And the results uh, of this trial, and these are again uh, gonna be updated at the next ASH meeting in a couple of weeks, was that um, DARA RVD uh, won for stringent complete responses at the end of the consolidation. So after a transplant and after the consolidation, deeper responses with the DARA RVD group to, compared to the RVD group. When you look at those responses, what made, um, what made up the majority, again, are those CRs, um, um, those CRs, those complete responses where the protein disappears and stringent complete responses as compared to RVD alone. Both Overall responses are fantastic. 99 to 91% overall responses, fantastic. But you do get deeper responses with their RVD. This is what uh, the update that they're going to show at the ASH meeting that's uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. Again, showing that even with maintenance therapy, the important point is that with maintenance therapy, uh, the update shows that you got deeper responses. With the DARA RVD, the, com those uh, complete responses went from 42% to 63%. That the maintenance therapy deepened the responses deeper on that iceberg, which, um, which should to translate into longer times for the disease to come back. Fantastic data. Response rates were longer, and the progression-free survival, again, longer at two years for Dura RVD than RVD alone. Still great responses with RVD, a little bit better with Dura RVD. So when you look at the, the, the regimens that we've used to treat myeloma over the years, when, when I was first doing this, when I had hair and I, I thought I had a high top fade, we were giving patients melphalan and prednisone and chemotherapy and responses. I mean, can you imagine? I used to tell patients, well, there's a one in three chance that you're going to respond to this regimen. Now, when you look at the application of science, adding three drug therapies where you get 100% and 98% response rates, and now the standard really is the responses should be over 90%. And really, the major responses need to be pushing that 80% barrier and higher, which is just fantastic, fantastic. And that is over a 20-year period. We went from one in three responses to basically 100% responses. In the new way, again, we're going, multiple trials looking at four drug regimens to treat myeloma. It's a busy slide, but I highlighted the overall response rates that are pushing 95, 93, 100, 100, 100, and deep responses, incredible data. So it's important to know what your goals of therapy are. What do you wanna do with, when, when, you're, when you're diagnosed with myeloma? How deep a response do you want? Is it just pain control or is it those deep, deep responses? Um, and again, know your M protein, the high, so you know when to celebrate when you when you've gone down on that iceberg. Because the higher the number of myeloma cells, the um, the higher the protein. When treatment has worked, lower the number of plasma cells, lower protein. Know your risk and stage. Um, your uh, understand your therapy options. I gave you that long list of induction therapies. Which one is the right one for you? 
um, know what is your response to therapy? Was it a very good partial response, partial response, or or um, or a complete response? Knows who know your the side effects. I didn't mention much about side effects, but these drugs do have side effects. Know the side effects and know who to call to report them because we've been doing this a long time. We know how to treat those side effects from these drugs. Know who's on your care team. Um, I recommend to my patients, and I see a lot of second opinions. There's so many new things with myeloma. It's important to get a second opinion, to get another perspective and more education on this disease. And always, always, always ask about clinical trials. My talk would have been five minutes long if I didn't have clinical trials, because that is what we base all these fan, all these outcomes on. So um, with three drug regimens, now again, the response rates are greater than 98%. Had five uh, drugs and indications approved by the FDA in this year. No other cancer is keeping uh, pace with the fantastic things that we're doing in myeloma, including new classes of drugs. You don't see that with other cancers. With novel therapies, the survival has markedly improved. When I had my high top fade, the survival was about three years um, with myeloma. Now it's greater than eight years. The 10-year relative survival is double. And this is my favorite part of the slide, my favorite slide of all time. In 2004, there were, were 54,000 people living with myeloma. That then jumped to 74,000 in 2011, which last year jumped to 100. And 24,000 people living in the United States with myeloma. It's not because that the incidence is that high, it's that people are surviving this disease. And you look at the jump between last year and this year, again, that, that 10,000 people are alive today than they were just a year ago because of what these new therapies have done. So myeloma is not curable yet, but is survivable now. And thank you. So, um, so I think I'll do questions. Let me just get to the question part. Um, so, um, so patient, let's see. Um, so, so one question I see, Revlimid is very expensive. Um, is there a generic on the way? Um, there um, isn't a generic on the way for, my, uh, for Revlimid. The uh, class of IMID drugs, um, you know, you have to go through the, uh, um, uh, the STEPS program in order to register and it, the and because and because it has a history um, that you know Revlimid is related to thalidomide, um, and so it's it really is a steps program that keeps and the potential um, problems with uh, birth defects that are associated with IMIDs that kind of keeps it from being going generic. However, um, there are multiple mechanisms um, that you should definitely ask the financial advisor at your cancer center or social worker, there are lots of mechanisms that are in place to try and help with the payment, but you are absolutely right that these drugs are very expensive. Um, I've, um, I have been diagnosed with smoldering myeloma and the fish suggests um, I'm high risk. Um, so that is, um, a, so does, a, uh, does it seem like a forward drug therapy is the best indica, uh, induction approach? So one thing that we have recently found out is that um, smoldering myeloma, um, especially when patients have the 20, 22, when the plasma is greater than 20%, and the 
um, flight chains are greater than 20 and the empirotene is greater than two. When you add on high risk high genetics, that that does um, increase um, the progression to symptomatic myeloma um, a bit higher. Um, and so for that group, um, again, there are, um, you know, when it, we, when it, uh, we, in regards to four drug induction therapy for that group, there are a couple fantastic clinical trials that are um, that are being done right now, looking at what is the the best induction for the if we should induce, and what are the best inductions for those high risk patients. The standard of care would be a close observation with consideration to suppressive therapy like Revlimid. Um, I've usually been watching those patients very closely, and then um, if it looks like they're evolving, um, that the protein is going up and up and up then I'll, and I'll do a treatment. And if the cytogenetics were high risk, um, that we would again lean towards um, either and um, primarily a four drug induction uh, regimen with uh, daratumumab. However, we'd also you know, consider um, using acrofilzomib-based um, um, induction. Um, I think that the tendency is leaning towards four drug induction. My maintenance therapy after transplant has only been in Laro. Um, should another uh, drug maintenance be considered? That's a really good, um, these are all good questions. But for Ninlaro, um, the, um, it kind of depends on what your risk is. If the Ninlaro was picked um, because of high risk, um, of their, uh, because of high risk of genetics, then definitely a proteasome based, um, a, a proteasome inhibitor based regimen um, is preferred. And again, that could um, be either a Velcade. We have changed during the pandemic a lot of our Velcade maintenances to Ninlaro maintenance, so they don't have to go into the hospital as much. But I guess you know the difference between using Ninlaro, Carfilzomib. Um, Velcade or Rev maintenance is based on risk and what your induction therapy was. When diagnosed with myeloma, should one have a conversation um, with my doctor includes uh, what recommended regimen is today and what? Sh so, um, so what I do, this is what I do, um, is when I see um, newly diagnosed patients um, as second opinions or um, or relapse patients, I usually say, you know, I give the, what we're going to use, what I give a list of recommendations. So here's the menu. And then what my recommendation off that menu would be kind of like when my wife and I go to the restaurant, she kind of gives me her, she's a dietitian. She gives me her recommendation of what I should eat. Um, it's very, it's always good. Um, and then, so you pick off the menu, what is the best therapy for you? You agree to that. And I always talk about the next thing. You know, if this doesn't get to the goal that you want, here is plan B. And we'll always plan one step ahead. And that includes with real, especially with relapse therapy. We're going to try this relapse therapy here, the options relapse therapy, which fits best for you. We make a decision, and if this doesn't work, here is the next thing. And sometimes that next thing is another second opinion to say, especially when you consider clinical trials. And again, clinical trials should always be considered as that upfront or as that second regimen. Um, I am currently in a remission and successful using single agent subcudera as maintenance. Oh, yes. I um, So I guess one thing is that we have all of our new starts and some of our uh, on therapy maintenance therapies that we were using um, intravenous DARA for, we are now using subcutaneous uh, DARA for, um, especially during the pandemic, because patients only need to be um, in the clinic for about 15 minutes. Um, there was a study that led to the FDA approval where they compared sub-Q DARA to intravenous DARA and basically found that the outcomes are similar, the efficacy is similar between the two. More importantly, that these uh, infusion reactions um, are less with sub-Q DARA. And of course, instead of spending seven hours getting that first infusion, it can only be a few minutes. So basically we have used sub-Q DARA maintenance, um, just started somebody on Friday with Sacudera maintenance and as upfront therapy. Um, 
Um, have you considered using DARA as induction therapy? Um, uh, yes. Um, so especially with the high risk patients um, that um, that we do use um, high um, uh, DARA RVD. Um, but again, I do talk to my patients about you know the one trick about DARA RVD and using any of the DARA regimens up front is um, is what to do at relapse. And really, that is because DARA has been using so much is initially approved as relapse therapy. Now moving to um, to upfront therapy is what to do at the time of relapse. And that is a very, very, very hot area of investigation is what's the what would be the next step. Hopefully, you know, with the deeper inductions, with their induction therapy, that it takes a longer time for those patients to then uh, relapse. Our blood biopsies available instead of bone marrow biopsies? Um, again, a uh, very good question. Um, a very not uh, a very 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 hot area of investigation, and really something that we want to move towards. We've been doing bone marrow biopsies to diagnose myeloma since 1900. 1900 is when we we've been doing that test for the diagnosis of myeloma. And so not only is the FDA interested in us moving away from bone marrow biopsies in order to get that cytogenetic information, um, there are a number of, of, of studies that are being done looking at the mutation DNA fragments floating around the blood to be able to give some of that cytogenetic and risk stratification data. When diagnosed with multiple myeloma should, oh, I think I answered that question. Um, and um, the um, I'm currently in, or oh, I answered that one already. Um, I am available for second opinions. Um, when diagnosed with myeloma, should one uh, have conversations with my doctor? I think I answered that one. Um, following initial therapy, oh, following initial therapy um, and stem cell transplant, I'm a Velcade maintenance drug. I'm standard risk. Why well, am I on Velcade and say Oh, I that's a, a, a good question. Um, um, the you know there are other things that I didn't include um, 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 earlier about why sometimes use proteasome inhibitors as maintenance therapy. Sometimes the patients have renal uh, renal failure um, at the time of induction. Uh, sometimes they'll use Velcade maintenance for that group too. Um, there was a study again that was done a number of years ago, and in in that um, and years ago and currently, uh, one thing that we consider for higher risk therapy um, again back in the day was renal uh, failure, um, and so sometimes uh, they used renal failure um, to um, uh, use Velcade for that. And sometimes if patients are intolerant to Revlimid, you know, if they've had you know. Um, allergic reactions, or they have intractable diarrhea that's unresponsive to therapy. Sometimes we use Velcade maintenance for that for that group. Um, I was MRD negative in May, and then had um, and then had 22 um, per million in June. Um, so what's the um, I think point of going from what is the point of going from MRD? A negativity MRD positivity? That's a really, really good question. Um, so it is a predictor at some point of having a, a relapse um, to go from MRD a negative to MRD positive. And a lot of people think that that really is the power of the test. MRD negativity doesn't mean that you're cured of the disease. It just means that you're deeper on that, um, um, on that continuum. Um, and so, um, uh, and so, when MRD is, becomes positive again, then you really do watch a bit, you know, a bit more closely. Um, we don't know yet if we should treat MRD negative to MRD positive um, quite yet. Um, is Craig, there any... I think there's a lot of questions going on. Is oh. there? You want to kind of wrap this up with two more, and then we can keep moving on. Sure, sure. Oh, um, thanks, Greg. Um. The um, is there any evidence of diet impacting outcomes, um, low carb versus fasting? So diet is very important. 
very important um, in myeloma of therapy. Is there, and I'm gonna, I'm married to a dietitian. Uh, we met with, in myeloma, actually. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's a long story. Um, but, um, but, is, but it's not a sexy diet that is important in myeloma. It is um, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, it is also um, um, not using a lot of complex carbohydrates, not using a lot of things that make your immune system do backflips. You know, your body has been processing apples and oranges for, you know, millions of years and not chicken McNuggets. Nothing against chicken McNuggets, but a lot of processed stuff in that. So fresh fruits and vegetables, drinking lots of water, drinking lots of fluids, um, and uh, maintaining exercise and possibly vitamin D. Um, and, um, and then I'll, one last, uh, what are your feelings about target BCMA therapy? Here's a blender up. And I will leave that to the, um, uh, leave that to the relapse talk because that drug was just approved. Very, very exciting drug that we use for, um, for relapsed uh, myeloma. Um, and already being looked at um, in or in concepts for upfront therapy. And I think that's it. Um, so thank you again so much. Thanks for listening. Well, Craig, thank you so much for handling all those questions. That was quite a mouthful there. But I do want to say something about nutrition. What's your wife think of Chick-fil-A? <laughs> so, okay. She's okay with that occasionally? I think I would too. Trouble. Well, listen, yeah. I, I, I told you this was going to be a lot of information. That's why you're going to be really glad when we send you the link to the presentation we just had. Craig, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal speech as you, or a presentation as you normally do. All right, now you tell your wife, Craig, that I'm asking people to stretch. She'll appreciate that. So everyone take <laughs> a few minutes and stretch. The position you're seeing is a yoga position where you, on your right arm or left, you grab the, the seat that you're sitting in, and with your right or left arm, reach for the sky and bend over it gently, just a little bit. Don't do a lot. And repeat that on the other side. So one, two, three, four, five, and then the next side, one, two, three, four, five. Now, I'd like you to stand up, but don't hit your knees on the computer. Tip it over and have your coffee spill on your computer. So we're gently move away from the table and stand up. Oh, now, isn't that great? We got some blood flowing now for the next half of this, and you guys are doing great. The questions are great. Um, some of the best I've seen in, uh, in the past mm -hmm. few years, so thank you for participating. Oh, one other thing. I remember 20 years ago that I used to go out to the field and to other support groups, and I had a 5 by 7 card on it, and it said thalidomide, and I got that from Dr. Dury, and he gave me the card and said, you know, talk about this and i didn't know what was in the card until i looked at it at the meeting and i said thalidomide and i said you have got to be kidding my first meeting with my loan was good i've learned a lot since then so with that silliness being said uh amira let's go to the next slide now there's a great thing coming up on december 1st where you can make a donation to the imf from your smartphone if you are watching this on your computer just use your camera on your phone Put, put it up towards the OCR, that little square with a lot of scribbles in it, and we'll give you a link to that. Remember, every dollar counts, every uh, opportunity is for the patient, and what we do is for a cure. So let's go on to the next speech here, or I, speech, presentation, I'm sorry. Dr. Panner, thank you for coming today. We are very grateful for you taking a Saturday off from your busy schedule. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for having me. It's always a pleasure oh. to talk in patient support groups and especially with the uh, International Myeloma Foundation. Gosh, thank you so much. Now, you're going to talk about relapse therapy and clinical trials. And uh, that's right. That's right. So everyone, once again, sharpen your pencils, get your notepad out. You're going to have lots of questions. I think that uh, uh, there was over 20 questions in the last segment, which is really good. So take it away, Dr. Panner. All right. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk. Um, uh, welcome from uh, the comfort of my home, and I hope you all are also seated comfortably in your home space. I look forward to see you hopefully in person next year, but we're doing the best that we can this year, and it's pretty awesome how we 
taking advantage of the technologies. I'm uh, glad I had this talk about, uh, I'm actually flipped it. I'm going to first talk about clinical trials and then treatment of relapse multiple myeloma. I think Dr. Greg very nicely showed that clinical trials are really the key to advancing the field, helping yourself and others in the same boat from the day um, you're diagnosed with multiple myeloma, even smoldering myeloma. But really, relapse myeloma is the place where you um, feel the impact of clinical trials the most. And I also think it's a kind of good playground to better understand uh, the impact on the clinical trials. So we'll look into why do we do clinical trials? I will slow down and introduce some ABCs of clinical trials. I realize that what is second nature to doctors may sound like a foreign language to the patients. So with uh, high respect to that, um, I hope I'll pick up the right pace for each of you. Some of you I know might be very much ahead of the game and familiar with the uh, clinical trial concepts and to some of this it could be a first time in your life you hear those concepts. Yeah, and then we'll dive in into updates in treatment of relapse multiple myeloma. If you notice when Dr. Craig was presenting treatment options, the relapse myeloma had the largest box <laughs> and would be an enormous uh, task to try to cover all of that. So I think I decided to prioritize what might be most interesting too, and that's what's on the horizon. You know, what are the newest things? How are they going to change the future of myeloma? How are we going to really push that survival curve even higher up? Next slide, please. So let's get started. Why do we do clinical trials? Because patients ask us questions. For example, how did I get multiple myeloma? And that can easily be rephrased into a research question. So what causes multiple myeloma? Patients ask, what is my stage? It's almost always the second question I hear from the patients. And we can uh, formulate it into research questions, how we can best predict what that myeloma is going to do in your life. What is your prognosis? Will I pass it to my children? That's a very common question in the clinic. And there is right there research question underneath. Is there genetic predisposition to multiple myeloma? Why is it that African Americans have twice as much of myeloma and Asians have even less than Caucasians of multiple myeloma? And we know there are a few families where myeloma indeed can run in a family. And what is so special about them? So what can I do about my cancer? I think this is the most empowering question. This is the one that I tend to spend most of the time in consultation with patients because honestly, it's really what matters at this point. What can you do once you have a cancer? And there's a whole slew of research questions that can be built around that answer. Which treatment is option is the best? Which one is the best for you? and uh, how we can make it even better. And then should I participate in a clinical trial? So I think this is a very uh, mature question to ask. You know, when I, I think when you get diagnosis of cancer, um, you feel like the curse has been put on you. And it takes a lot to see that there could be also a blessing in that, 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 that you've been given a superpower to change the world when you get such a big challenge in front of you. And clinical trials is really the way to express that superpower. You know, when you do participate in a clinical trial, you may or may not be helping yourself, right? We wouldn't do clinical trials if we knew what's the best for you. But you're really um, taking a chance, you're taking a stand to figure out for it for yourself and for others as well and pass it on to other generations. It's very important to pass on not just myeloma, but also um, the improvements in treatment of myeloma to future generations, whether it would be your kids or other people, right? Somebody else's child, somebody else's uh, parent. Mm -hmm. So clinical trials really help us to improve what we have to treat myeloma and uh, improve standard of care myeloma. I put this uh, uh, timeline um, of drug development in multiple myeloma. 
you can see that very first um, drug ever to be proven to be effective in myeloma dates back to 1958. And you can see big gaps, years lost in drug development, and then really, really intense timeline here in the past decade. I'll second to Dr. Greg, no other cancer actually can brag about that many advances as multiple myeloma can. And we're not even done. And in the bottom, you see uh, the median progress, uh, sorry, median overall survival, meaning how long people live with multiple myeloma and how that corresponds to developments and treatment. So if we go back to 1958, people with myeloma lived than a year, less than a year. In 80s, when the transplant really took off as a way to give Belfalan and uh, impact survival, that was pushed to three years. And now with every drug development, you see that those numbers are getting higher and higher. And uh, we're not quite curing myeloma. We might be curing in some patients, but we don't know because just not enough of time has passed to say with certainty. But we're getting there. I think we're getting there with every step. So let's move to the next um, slide of therapy. So, you know, not each clinical trials uh, clinical trial is um, designed equally. Not every clinical trial fits you. Not every patient fits for clinical trial. I'd like to present this spectrum of trials. You know how really drugs are developed and that it takes decades to get drug from the chemistry lab into clinical practice. So all, all the drugs that we have today started in a the lab. They started in animal models, you know, first in cell models, then in animal models. So when patients say, oh, I don't want to be a guinea pig, my favorite answer is, well, you can, because we already did this on guinea pigs. <laughs> So these very early preclinical phase trials that you see on the left side is really to answer the question, is this drug killing myeloma cells? <clears throat> is it killing myeloma cells before it kills a mouse, right? It, no matter how active drug it is, we can't afford to lose patients uh, before we win against cancer. So only when it's proven in these preclinical studies that yes, the drug has activity, and uh, there is a reasonable safety associated with this drug in animal models, only then does it move to human trials. And there are, I would say, three phases of the trials, of so the study of the drug. The phase one trials are considered early phase trials. We start out um, in, with patients who have no more treatment options left. Their only option would be to go home with hospice, to focus on their comfort. And if patient is still in good enough health and motivated to fight cancer, then clinical trials that are in phase one are perfect choice. Those are usually very small studies. The drug is administered first in minuscule doses to make sure it's safe. So safety is the key focus of these studies. And uh, once, um, once we find what is that safe dose by escalating it slowly and watching patients carefully, then we can move into phase two trial. And the goal of phase two trial is to expand it to more patients, uh, to study drug at the dose that seems to be safe and effective and answer questions. So how many of patients will respond to this drug. And I think the good number to remember is if about 20% of patients respond to the drug, we consider it active. It's worth to continue to explore this drug. Um, it's worth to bring it into clinical practice for patients with no treatment options. And uh, it's worth to start building in into other regimens and maybe even compare it to, to standard of care. And those are your phase three trials. Phase three trials is when you compare novel way of treating, experimental way of treating. Many times it's adding a new drug to the standard of care regimens or replacing one of the drugs in standard of care regimens. 
and comparing it to a standard of care regimen. So these are the ultimate studies that FDA looks for to approve the drugs. Some drugs can be approved on phase two trial data. Uh, those usually are approved for patients with an unmet medical need, but really to change standard of care, you need to have phase three uh, clinical trial, ideally. So I hope that this sets the stage, and I just wanna check in at this point if there are any questions and if I need to clarify. Well, thank you. Are there questions out there? Do you see that, Agnes, on your uh, on your computer where they're asking questions? Yeah, and I I don't see anything specifically about clinical trials. Do you, Kelly? Am I missing anything? No, I don't. Uh, Amira, do you see anything about clinical trials? No, uh, not yet. Okay, All let's right. keep so going. If you oh. are all still with me, let's let's hit the road. So here's the roadblocks in myeloma journey. And you already saw some of this in Dr. Craig's presentation. So when patients get diagnosed with myeloma, they go through induction therapy. If they can, they go for transplant and maintenance. We hope they stay in remission as long as possible, but we also warn them that relapse is practically inevitable. We just don't know when it's gonna happen. So first time disease comes back, we call it early relapse because we still have a lot of tools to treat multiple myeloma. It's usually fairly still sensitive to treatments. And as we go through more and more relapses, we start to run out of treatment options and disease becomes also more resistant to those treatments available it becomes cancer becomes educated on chemotherapy and when it comes to clinical trials and research it kind of follows the backward flow all right so we start out with early phase studies in patients who have unmet medical need they are out of treatment options and as we prove that the drugs are safe and people respond we can start moving it into the earlier lines of therapy and even to upfront therapy of multiple myeloma. So I hope it helps you kind of put it um, in a perspective of how to think of clinical trials and uh, to really give you tools to recognize when you read about trial, is this phase one? Is this phase two? Is this phase three? Does this apply to me? or this is just something to keep in mind and keep my eyes open as the field involves where that uh, development is gonna take us. Next slide, please. So terminology, we really digged into what is the phase uh, of the trial, patient population, when you read studies or you're gonna hear me present some studies, think about it. Are patients that this uh, drug was tested in similar to me? So I'd say yesterday in clinic, I probably heard 10 times question, is COVID vaccine gonna be for me? And that my answer was, well, we don't have yet a full data on those vaccines that are now very effective. And we don't know yet how many patients with cancer participated and specifically how many patients with blood cancer participated in those clinical trials. So patient population who participated are these patients like me or not, right? Are they newly diagnosed? Are they relapsed patients? Randomized, so when you hear phase three, they usually are randomized trial, meaning that it wasn't the patient or the doctor decided which treatment you are gonna get. It was computer who flipped the coin to said you getting standard of care and you are getting experimental treatment. That's the only way to do fair comparison and really compare head to head as opposed to apples to oranges, okay? If the uh, phase three trial was not randomized, you probably not getting a clear picture on uh, uh, how comparable those two arms are. Response rates, so when we speak of response, we wanna see at least 50% reduction in tumor volume. So it would be the monoclonal protein, decline in other cancers many times is how much the tumor shrank, but in myeloma, like Dr. Craig showed, we use monoclonal protein to measure how much myeloma has shrunk with the treatment. So overall response rate will be all the patients who at least have the drop in monoclonal protein. 
progression-free survival is uh, many, uh, many times the most important uh, or primary, I would call, endpoint of uh, clinical trials. We want to know not only how many patients respond, but actually how long they stay in remission, right? If you have a drug where 90% or 100% patients respond, but two months later, the disease is back, um, I'm not sure it's uh, that response rate is as important if compared to where half of the patients respond, but then patients who respond do stay in remission for five years. You know, so it's important to know both the response rate, what are your chances that this drug will um, work for you? But then the next question should be, how long can I expect to stay in remission? So two very important uh, pieces of information when you read about clinical trials. Now, overall survival is really the gold standard in oncology when it comes to determining effectiveness of treatment. So if you can prove that your treatment is going to make people live longer, not just stay in remission longer, but live longer, that, that can be beaten. That, that's the best evidence that the treatment is worthwhile that you have a good treatment in your hands. But that is the hardest endpoint in trials to reach. So many times we make decisions and change our practice without having overall survival data, because especially now with people living so long, it can take a decade before you see that overall survival benefit. So again, valuable um, finding to be aware of in clinical trials. And then adverse events. Every time you learn about new treatments, you need to ask, at what cost is this benefit coming? What's going to be the impact on my quality of life? Am I risking my life by taking this treatment? Is it worth the benefit that treatment is offering? So adverse events are very important. And actually, many times when we recommend treatments, it's not only based on what is the chance that you'll respond of the treatment, but What's the chance you're going to be able to handle those side effects? We really look at patients' overall health, um, previous side effects of the treatment, and try to do no harm first. Pick the treatment that will give you the best quality of life um, and the best benefit that way. So looking for balance between response and tolerability of the treatment. So... When we talk about trials in relapse multiple myeloma, we want to talk about new drugs for patients with relapse refractory disease, and those usually are going to be trials with phase one, phase two data. Then we're also interested in how these new drugs can be incorporated into old regimens. Do they add benefit when they are used together with drugs that already have been in practice? And that's usually also your phase one, two trials. And then comparing new treatments to standard of care regimens. When you have two arms where one ex is experimental, another one is standard of treatment, and perhaps computer is going to decide which treatment you get, that's your phase three trials. Some phase two trials too can have comparison built into it. So I tried to break down the treatments of multiple myeloma into these boxes. So we have classes of the drugs that you see listed on the very uh, top in the blue box. The oldest drugs in myeloma are alkylating agents. The oldest of those is melphalan, and nowadays I'd say we only use it in a form of transplant. But there are others. There is cyclophosphamide, there is bendamustine, a little bit less commonly used um, alkylators. Then we have a very important box of immunomodulatory agents, and of those you probably heard lenalidomide or Revlimid would be the trade name of it. Um, that's pretty much used from in the upfront treatment of multiple myeloma and the key drug to the maintenance. The cousin of lenalidomide is pomalidomide. Then we have box of proteasome inhibitors, also very important drugs from a get-go in treatment of myeloma. We have three of them here, bortezomib, exasomib, carfilzomib. These uh, drugs have been around since the um, verge of century, I'd say, uh, somewhere in early 2000s, then came into practice. Now, anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody daratumumab is somewhat a newer kid on the block, but it's already been around for over five years 
And as you heard from Dr. Greg, is really marching in into that newly diagnosed myeloma space. Um, there is still a little bit more data that we need to really firmly accept it as a standard of care, but uh, but it, it's getting there. So if you can advance the slide, I'm gonna box, oh no, go back by one. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna mark in this red box uh, three major classes of drugs that are now pretty much standard of care. Patients with multiple myeloma really should have tasted um, at least one drug in each class before we uh, come to conclusion we're running out of treatment options. And that's so-called triple class refractory multiple myeloma. Only since um, last year, we actually got FDA approved therapies for patients who are triple class refractory. Next slide, please. And uh, those new treatments for triple class refractory myeloma can be within the same class of the drug that's already available. You know, uh, usually drugs are developed to be more potent and less toxic when they are added to the same drug classes. So among alkylators, we're gonna talk about the melflufan a little bit. That's a very interesting alkylator that's coming up. It's not yet FDA approved. It's still in clinical trials, but it might be next year. Iberdamide is a very interesting immunomodulatory agent, even more potent, stronger than uh, pomalidomide. It's an early phase, uh, phase uh, trials. And then another anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody was approved this year, and that's isatuximab. So very similar to daratumumab, but it is uh, slightly different in certain ways too. That is already FDA approved. Next slide, please. And then new therapies uh, for triple class refractory patients can, can be agents with entirely new class uh, and mechanism of action. And uh, there's a big wave of therapies coming up. I'm gonna uh, group them in anti-BCMA therapies category. I could make three categories out of this because there are CAR T cells, there are bispecific T cell engagers and monoclonal antibody drug conjugate. So it, they all share the same target on multiple myeloma, and that's B cell maturation antigen. That's what what is common for this group of drugs. But they, these three drugs have very different mechanism of action, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I think. This is probably where most of interest now is in scientific community, and I think you would want to know the most about these upcoming therapies. I do believe they're going to make a big change in natural history of multiple myeloma as they get integrated into uh, multiple myeloma, various lines of therapy. We're going to really see the jump in that overall survival. Now, Selinexor is a very interesting drug. It was approved by FDA last summer. It's called Expo-1 inhibitor. That's the only drug in that class of the drugs, really novel mechanism of action. And then I highlighted melflufan again, because it is a, a drug that makes us think in new ways of old drugs. So it is different, that, even though it's still alkylator, but how it's delivered to the cells is different from classic alkylators. Um, so let's dig in a little bit more into what's uh, what are the updates in relapse myeloma? What's coming up here in the near future? And we're going to start off uh, by talking about B cell maturation um, targeting th uh, antigen targeting therapies. Um, I break down into those three. You can dream about them. That would be your dream trials. About uh, that's usually belantamab, uh, including trials. Um, antibody drug conjugate. You can drive cars to the future. That's your CAR T cell trials uh, that are targeting B cell maturation antigen. Or you can try to bite that target, and that's your bispecific T cell engager clinical trials. All are very interesting therapies. Let's move on to next slide. So CAR T cells, I think they are really getting a lot of publicity. Um, it's a very novel way of treating multiple myeloma. And I hope this picture 
helps uh, to understand how they work. So CARS really has nothing to do with what we drive to work. CARS stands for Chimeric Antigen Receptor T-Cell Therapies. So how do they work? The T-cells, your natural immune cells, are taken from your body, a uh, process similar to what's done during transplant. It's just that this time it's not your stem cells. It's your T-cells, your lymphocytes that are collected in the bag. They are managed, manufactured in the factory outside of your body. In a uh, factory, they are educated to recognize cancer antigen. So we think that uh, people who get cancer uh, usually have a problem with immune system, where immune system fails to recognize that there is something foreign going on in their body. Uh, their immunity to cancer becomes weak. So in the factory, the T cells can be educated. They can be engineered to express receptors that recognize cancer. And those T, uh, T cells again are collected, expanded. Uh, they are brought back in a bag and infused to the patient in the clinic. So similar but also different process to stem cell. Uh, could you please advance uh, the slide? So I, uh, there are so, so many uh, CAR T cell trials right now, maybe uh, close to 40 at least different products are being tested. But BB2121, that's a blue, uh, Bluebird project, is probably the most advanced CAR T cell. And we're expecting that it could get FDA approved sometimes uh, later in the year. So I wanted to show you this graph. You may not be familiar uh, with how to read it and how to understand this kind of presentation of the results of the study. So I will take a little bit of time to uh, go through the slide. If you see on the left side, from bottom to the top, um, those lines represent increase in the dose. So in the early phase trials, we talked that patients are exposed to higher and higher dose till we finally, finally find the dose that works and is still safe to administer. So that's what the, that uh, on the left side, you see the rising lines uh, represents that's increasing dose goes from 50 um, to 800 on a, uh, towards the uh, moving to the right side uh, there's a uh, line that shows months meaning how long patients responded uh, maintain the response uh, to treatment, how long they stayed on a treatment and how long they responded to the treatment. And each color has different meaning. So you want to pay most attention to light blue and more intense blue. Those are the deep responses. Complete response, very good partial response. Uh, that's the responses that we are after. Uh, partial response is highlighted in light green color, minor response in a deep green color, and you don't quite see much of deep green in this graph. And then the, the black would be, represent progression of the disease. So you see some of these graphs end with a black uh, bar. That means disease progressed and therefore patient had to stop treatment or come off of the clinical trial. Now, yellow stars here mean MRD negative response. So not only these patients are in complete response, but they're really in the bottom of that iceberg that Dr. Craig showed earlier. They are in the deepest uh, possible for us to measure response. Uh, but you can tell if you pay more attention, that doesn't quite mean they're cured. Even patients with uh, yellow stars on their um, myeloma journey have that black bar in the end of it, you can see that the disease eventually progresses. So what what fascinates all of us with these CAR T cells, um, that responses are extremely high. You know, if I mentioned earlier that 20% response for patients with no more therapies available is a good number, here you see that close to 100% of patients respond to treatment. That's remarkable. I don't think we've had that in the history of myeloma. Even the best drugs we have today, like daratumumab, carfilzomib, pomalidomide, their response rates were 20 to 30% at the most in relapsed refractory. And here you go, 
close to 100% response rates with CAR T cells. Um, it's uh, disappointing that that unfortunately doesn't translate to cure at this point. It's uh, disappointing that patients re uh, eventually relapse, but it does give us a, a lot of hope. If this works in patients who don't have any more treatment options, we all are very hopeful to see what it will do when it is introduced into earlier lines of therapy. So stay tuned. CAR T cells are very promising therapy. I hope this graph um, is a little bit easier to understand at this point, and you'll be more equipped when you see in the future these kind of graphs. Could you please advance the slide? You know, um, I do have to be um, balanced in my discussions, both in lectures and real life. So here we go, adverse events. What to expect with CAR T cells other than great response? And so some of the side effects are you know, expected. We we deal with low blood counts throughout the treatment of multiple myeloma. We all are very equipped to deal with them, but yeah, you have to be prepared for that. Just like after transplant, you should expect that your blood counts will get low. You may need blood transfusion support, and you may be at risk of infection when your white cell count is low. Your immune system is gonna take a deep dive before it recovers from this treatment. So that's not much new. Uh, could you please advance? Uh, yeah, and this is what's new. So what's unique about CAR T cell side effects, it can cause something called cytokine release syndrome. Uh, that's like an immune system storm. You can only imagine if you bringing in those educated expanded T cells that didn't know how to do their job before they were engineered, and now they do know how to do the job, the body will respond with a strong immune reaction. Um, you can think of cytokine release syndrome as your worst flu. So some people with flu will stay home and recover with some Tylenol. That's your low-grade cytokine release uh, syndrome. But some people will end up in an intensive care unit and will need a lot of support to get through this immune system storm. That's your grade three, grade four uh, cytokine release syndrome. So fortunately, uh, severe ones are not so common, but the uh, any grade or low grade uh, cytokine release syndrome is pretty common with CAR T cells. Yeah, so when we choose patients for CAR T cells, we want to take that into account. Do they have enough of uh, body reserve to deal with cytokine release syndrome? Now, another unique side effect that um, is very intriguing, and I don't think um, the scientific community yet well understands why that happens, is the neurologic toxicity. It can be as mild as um, slight mental status changes and as severe as seizures and coma and death. So again, side effect that um, is important to understand, important to manage well. Again, nearly half of patients will ex experience some level of neurologic toxicity based on this trial results. Few patients will have very severe um, neurologic uh, um, damage. So uh, definitely effective promising treatment that comes at a cost. And I hope as time goes, we will learn how to manage these side effects better and make these therapies safer and therefore available to more patients. Uh, let's move to the next one. So I want to talk now a little bit about different anti-BCMA therapy. And that's Belantamif methadotin. It was approved uh, in August, I believe, of this year by FDA for treatment of relapse refractory multiple myeloma. So this is a new option for treatment for patients who have ran out of immunomodulatory drugs, proteasome inhibitors, and have become refractory to daratumumab. Uh, this is phase two trial that I'm talking about. So remember, the key here was to figure out what's the response rate. That's the key finding in the study. So response rate was about 31, 34%. And if you remember the cutoff of 20%, this is well above it. 
This is very comparable and maybe even better to the best drugs um, like daratumumab, curfuzumab in the similar setting when it was tested in relapse refractory patients. So very promising uh, treatment. I think we'll see it move into early alliance of therapy in the near future. Now, side effects to be familiar uh, uh, with, one is keratopathy. This is something unique to this drug. No other drug in myeloma has a side effect. This is something, you know, doctors need to learn um, how to manage. For the time being, um, what we can say about keratopathy is that it can cause dry eyes. I don't know if you're a kind of person who wakes up in the winter with feeling like there's sand in your eyes and you can't even see clearly till you get those natural tears in. I'm very familiar with that feeling. <laughs> so this is what you get with Belantamab. It could happen. And again, not well understood why that happens or how to manage. So the only thing we can do is uh, recognize it early. Patients need to have eye exam before each dose to see if they're developing the keratopathy uh, and uh, hold the treatment till it recovers. And it almost always recovers. So nobody went blind on this trial. This is a reversible toxicity, but it could uh, uh, limit your ability to receive treatment. Low blood counts, again, uh, quite expected. We know what to do with them. Um, what is uh, interesting that infusion reactions are pretty low. Actually, uh, good news to patients uh, is that these 31-34% uh, response rates are without steroids. You know, we use steroids left and right practically in every regimen of multiple myeloma. And uh, I will say it's the hardest drug to tolerate for patients. It's dexamethasone. So this is a treatment option that actually does not require steroids, not even for infusion reaction prevention very low rates of infusion reaction. Um, so if, if you are a kind of patient who's running out of treatment options and uh, wondering what's, uh, what could be available, this is certainly what you want to ask your oncologist in the clinic. Could I be a candidate for belantamab? Let's move to the next anti-BCMA therapy, and I'll briefly talk about bispecific T-cell engager, AMG420. There are more of them in development. This is very early phase one trial data um, that was uh, recently published this year. So drug is still far away from getting FDA approved, but again, very promising and interesting form of therapy. Uh, so bispecific T-cell engager is given as uh, in continuous intravenous infusion. Go back, please, by one slide. And... Uh, uh, all we know right now about this drug uh, in early phase development, that um, response rates among patients who were, the, were treated with a maximum tolerated dose was 70%. And uh, uh, the dose limiting toxicity with this drug also was cytokine release syndrome, like with CAR T cells, and then neuropathy. Um, but other than that, it seemed to be well tolerated. Again, keep in mind, this is a small study, phase one, only 42 patients participated, and uh, seven patients among those were treated at the maximum tolerated dose. So promising, intriguing, keep your eyes open. Remember, this is coming. It's nowhere near about us talking how to incorporate it into clinical practice. Next slide, please. I will speak a little bit about Selinexor. I think it's, uh, it certainly deserves attention because it's drug with a very novel mechanism of action. I put up here a picture. Pictures to some of us can be worth a million words. <laughs> so what you want to focus on is that a circle in the middle of the picture. So the pink barrier is the baseline membrane of mitochondria. And uh, X14-1 is a molecule that moves uh, tumor suppressor genes from inside of mitochondria into cytoplasm. So Selinoxar is the drug that blocks that process and allows tumor suppressing genes to accumulate 
inside of the mitochondria and do the job they're supposed to do. If you're absent, you can't do your job. So exporting one inhibitor, selenexor, retains tumor suppressor genes inside of cell. So very interesting uh, mechanism of action. Let's move the slide forward. Um, Selenexa was studied also for patients with triple class refractory multiple myeloma. And in the phase two trial, it was given as a pill given twice a week in combination with dexamethasone. So this drug requires dexamethasone in order to work, something to keep in mind. Response rates here were 26%. So that's enough for us to say this is an active drug. Progression-free survival was 3.7 months. Overall survival was 8.6 months. These numbers may not sound like a long duration of remission or even life expectancy, but keep in mind this was studied in patients who had no treatment options and who were progressing with their disease. So this was certainly enough for FDA to approve uh, the drug. It is available to use in clinic for the past year. Uh, please advance the slide to the next one. Certainly, we need to talk about uh, side effect profile with new mechanism of action, new side effects uh, also come along. Um, this is one of the drugs in multiple myeloma that can really make people nauseated. We were very spoiled with in our practice, right, Dr. Craig? We barely ever have to use drugs for nausea, and with this one, we do big time, sometimes three drugs to prevent nausea. Um, patients can have a lot of fatigue. We, of course, have to recognize this was in patients who had very, very advanced cancer. So fatigue is not uncommon in that situation. But there is something about the drug itself that it drains you. It gives you this low energy and you may need even to be on medications like Ritalin or methylphenidate to, uh, to stimulate your energy level. And then low blood counts are common. There's nothing much you knew to say there. Now, low, um, low salt is something unique. The drug can cause salt wasting, especially if patients are not eating well. So this is one time where I tell patients, remember all that food you were told not to eat? Go for it. French fries, chips, pickles, you know, go for that salt. It's like it's really going to help you to get through this treatment. And what's important to say that if you can get through the first two months of treatment, then things somehow get better. Most of these side effects seem to be most pronounced in the first two months. And if you can learn to support uh, patients through these side effects, uh, you could be um, on a drug that's acting and keeping you in a remission for a long time. Let's move slide. Now, I will talk a little bit about Horizon trial. So this is not FDA approved, but it's under review. And we think that probably early next year, it could be FDA approved. So a uh, complicated picture. We're going to start in the right upper corner of it. Uh, the drug is um, attached to a protein, to a peptide, uh, that makes it very lipophilic, meaning it slides into cells through the membrane very easily. It penetrates very easily. And once it is inside of the cancer cell, um, myeloma cells actually uh, have enzymes that can cleave that molecule. It's called aminopeptidases. This is unique feature of multiple myeloma cell. Multiple myeloma cells, as it is, are factories for making proteins, right? That's why we have monoclonal protein in the blood. But at the same time, they also rich in enzymes that break down proteins. So this drug is taking advantage of that feature of multiple myeloma cells, and it allows alkylator to be delivered in a targeted way. Once the molecule is cleaved, the peptide is released, and the alkylator is free to do its job and damage the DNA. That further increases gradient and pulls in even more of the melflufan into cancer cell. So you can actually have 50 times higher concentrations of alkylator within cancer cell than with other alkylators and yet have very little of activity on normal body cells. 
I had an opportunity to be a principal investigator on this trial, and I have hands-on experience with treating patients with this drug. It's remarkably well tolerated, other than low blood counts. It, it can really lower the blood counts, but other than that, no nausea, no fatigue. Um, it was impressive how well patients were tolerating. No loss of hair, no mucositis. Those are kind of the side effects we typically see with alkylators. So now that we kind of uh, looked into how it works and why it could be uh, better than other alkylators, let's see what kind of response rates we get. And response rate in these refractory patients with multiple myeloma was 29%. Uh, 26 in triple class refractory. And what's very interesting, some of patients with myeloma, when they relapse, they can present with tumors outside of the bone. We call it extramedullary disease. It's not typical for myeloma to do that, especially not in the beginning. If you have outside of the bone tumors, extramedullary plasma cytomas, that's typically a sign of very aggressive myeloma. We sometimes refer to that as a lymphomatous behavior. And it's been kind of an agreement, I think, in myeloma community that uh, those type of plasma cytomas respond better to conventional chemotherapy than novel agents. And, uh, you know, melflufan certainly has um, good activity in it. So 24% response rate for extramedullary disease, that's pretty impressive, actually, in this setting. So let's move to the next slide. These response rates translate to median progression-free survival of about four months. And if you zoom in into EMD, which is extramedullary disease, you'll see that progression-free survival is only 2.9 months. So that's taking together patients who respond and patients who don't respond. And if 26% respond, that means three out of four do not respond. If you zoom in into patients who are responding, the interesting thing here is that patients with extramedullary disease who respond to melflufan have actually impressively long duration of response of 17 months. In uh, other populations is about eight and a half months. So interesting drug, I think this could be very important in the, these aggressive myelomas and certainly something that needs to be looked in further, studied to understand how best to use this drug. Very interesting and valuable addition, I think, coming up to myeloma treatment. Let's move to the next slide. And uh, yeah, here, I think I would like to thank you. I'm not gonna dig in into much more therapies. I think it's a lot of information as it is. It, it really was, Dr. Panner, and I'm glad that we're uh, that you said it was okay to keep the slides up on our website. You yeah. covered a lot of topics. If it, if if there was a hundred people out there in the crowd, we're all giving a big round of applause to you. Thank you. I hope I didn't go over to my time too too much. Thank no, they, they give me ten minutes in the beginning, and I can only you know you all know me. I like to talk, but when I'm doing this, it's one or two minutes, so you guys all get a little more time, which works Thank out. You. Um. Do you want to answer some of the questions that you see over on your screen? Yeah, let's see what we've got here. So is the cytokine release syndrome similar to what happens with COVID patients? Uh, yes, it is similar. It's uh, not necessarily uh, uh, affecting lungs as, um, you know, what we see in COVID, but the very idea is similar that... Uh, you know, it's it's not the cancer, it's not the drug, it's your immune system that's causing damage in your body. Um, okay. Now, uh, Kelly, could you help me with other questions? I have a little hard time here. Okay. Um, a patient came up with a question, how do you treat a patient who is refractory to DARA? Mm -hmm. So if you refractory to DARA, um, you may or may not be refractory to proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulatory agents. But if you are refractory to those and DARA, then you have so-called triple class refractory multiple myeloma. And if that's the case, then there are now FDA-approved therapies, <clears throat> Solidactor, Belantamab, 
or you should be looking into clinical trials. Okay. Um, a person I know, but I won't say her name, said excellent information. Thank you. And she I, knows I, I'm happy it was helpful. And she knows what she's talking about. Let's see. Um, I believe it's one of your patients too. Dr. Panner, do you have any patients in le le clinical trials on an investigative drug? Where is it? I'm not, I'm having a little issue here too. There it is. Um, okay, let me read the question again. I'm sorry. Dr. Panner, do you have a, my, any patients in a clinical trial on an investigation, investigational drug currently? Um, currently, I don't. You know, with the COVID, uh, it slowed down research. I have to say a lot of efforts were channeled uh, towards COVID research. Sure. And, you know, Rush Hospital is uh, really the key hospital in Chicago, I would say, when it comes to COVID. But we are coming up. We are we are opening a trial that's going to be for relapse refractory uh, patients, I think, in uh Next couple of months, we should have that open and running. Mm -hmm. Now, I had another comment here. When do you decide to go this route, and how did they, how do they respond? That's an interesting question. I guess when do you decide to go with a patient to clinical trials? So again, there are various clinical trials. You really need to have that conversation with your treating physician. Uh, I think it's fair for doctors to tell them not only clinical trials that they have in their institution, but clinical trials that other institutions might might have in uh, in town. You know, you you want to try new drugs if you are out of treatment options. That that's the you know kind of the easiest scenario. If you have no more treatment options and you're still in good enough health, this is time to look for clinical trial with a new drug. But even before then, you know, every time you face question, uh, what should be my treatment? You really are uh, also asking questions, should I be on a clinical trial? Is there a clinical trial I uh, could be eligible for? So at, at any step in treatment of multiple myeloma, you could be thinking about clinical trial, but for sure, when you're out of treatment options. Okay. Um, does a patient typically keep responding, even if um, I'm I'm terrible with saying the drug's name? Belalontamu is current is held due to care carapathy. I'm terrible. Well, so I'm glad you asked that question. Actually, it is uh, something interesting about belantamab that once patient responds, they can uh, maintain that response for a long time even when the drug is held. So right now, drug is given every three weeks. That's how it was studied. But it might be that, you know, in the future, we'll be giving it less often because response do last um, a long time. It must be just an amazing experience that both you doctors and the nurses, of course, get to see such not radical and bad way but radical changes that help the myeloma patients it just was it, mu it must be mind boggling yeah it it really is it it really is i think you know that's part of the reason why i love to do what i do first of all i love my job because of the people that i meet and the second is because i get to get this hands on on awesome science and see things actually get better in this world sure Science is it. I've known Craig for many years, and that's what he's told me. And I use science <laughs> a lot more than I've ever used it before in my life. My science teacher in high school would be shocked. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Thanks, Dr. Panner. I knew you were going to rock this one, and I really appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Next, really a oh, great, great. Next, health in the COVID era. Now, we, I saw a lot of questions in the beginning about COVID. Uh, Amy is... is uh, as a specialist nurse, and there you see all her acronyms, and I think she has another 10. But what, nonetheless, Amy, take it away and start with your first slide. Thank you so much, Kelly. So good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here virtually in your homes. And a big thank you to Dr. Cole and Dr. Panner. Such wonderful presentations, so informative on myeloma and relapse refractory. It's really exciting to see all the changes that have been happening over the past several years, really encouraging for our patients. 
Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about being your best healthcare advocate. Um, every year we have a different theme for the presentation, and today I'm going to talk about being the commander of your galactic journey. It's a space theme this year, and we're going to be talking about being your best advocate in the COVID era for your health. Now, your healthcare team is here to help you as always but particularly now that more than ever to help you stay healthy, right? So you are in the center and your entire healthcare team is around you. And that includes your medical oncologist and maybe even a myeloma specialist. Some people have both. Some people may just have a local oncologist who's in charge of their care and maybe a myeloma specialist that weighs in from time to time as a second opinion or maybe even comes in during that kind of decision-making point. Um, but some people have both, some people only have one, and both are equally important in your care. And then you also have your allied health staff that can include a nutritionist like Dr. Cole's wife, or maybe even a physical therapist that's involved in your care. And then of course your family support network. So that could be your, your caregivers itself or other members of your family, what I like to call kind of the truth squad and the clinic visits, the people who tell you what's really going on with the patient sometimes. Um, they're important and involved in your health care as well. Your primary care physician, please don't forget about your primary care physician because they're really in charge of you from head to toe. As your medical oncologist and your myeloma specialist, we're laser focused on your myeloma, but your primary care physician is really in charge of you as a whole. So they're in charge of your uh, their, your blood sugar levels, your cholesterol levels, making sure you're getting your mammograms, your colonoscopies, your PSA checks. So just because you don't have myeloma doesn't mean you should ignore the rest of the stuff going on with your body. Make sure you're getting your routine health maintenance with your primary care physician. And then of course you may have subspecialists as well. So that may include a nephrologist, like a kidney doctor, maybe a radiation oncologist, a pain specialist, an orthopedic surgeon. All of these people are in charge of maintaining your health in terms of your myeloma and your general health as well, and we're all here to help you. Now, preparing for your appointment is always very important. It's always important to prepare for your visit with your physician or your nurse practitioner like me, but particularly in this current COVID era, as things are always in flux and new question situations are always bound to occur. So make sure before your visit, write down your questions and your concerns about your myeloma health, but also about COVID as well. And bring a current medication list. Now this is including supplements too that you can buy over the counter. You may not consider them medications, but we do. And it's important for us to know what supplements you're taking to make sure they don't interact with your myeloma therapy. And of course, any medical or life changes since your last visit is important to know. This can include visits with other specialists, hospitalizations, surgeries or procedures you may have, maybe new diagnoses that we need to know about. So please keep us updated about that. And then of course, current symptoms, have they changed at all? I always tell my patients, please keep track of your symptoms and see how they've improved or maybe flared since your last appointment, or if any new symptoms have developed that you're concerned about. And then at your appointment, new thing in this COVID era, remember to bring your mask and also a list of your current medications that I talked about. Make sure you understand your treatment plan and what the next steps are. Ask all your questions, your important questions up front about your myeloma and your treatment plan so you don't leave with any outstanding questions. Have a list of who to contact in your healthcare uh, team and, and when you can contact them. And sometimes we have patient portals, which is another way that we can contact our healthcare team and also have a caregiver. And a lot of the times as cases are surging, we may not be able to bring our caregiver physically with our appointment. And if you're unable to do this and you're concerned, you may miss something and you really need another set of ears, ask if it's okay to call your caregiver or your friend to listen in on the visit over the phone, maybe by FaceTime or even just kind of regular on speakerphone. And then at home, make sure you're taking precautions to stay healthy. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that in the subsequent slides. Communicate with your health 
with your members of your healthcare team and make sure taking your medications as directed. Your medications only work if you take them. So an oral adherence is really key. And it might be prudent to have an extra supply of medications on hand, just so you can minimize visits to the pharmacy to reduce your risk of you know, exposure, or maybe you can have your medications delivered. And then make sure you update your healthcare crew between visits so your family members and caregivers know what's going on if they weren't able to participate in the visit. So now telemedicine is more prominent than ever. It's been around for a long time, but we're using telehealth or telemedicine more and more in the COVID era. And so being acquainted with telemedicine is important. Check with your healthcare provider if this is an option. And if it's an option, make sure you plan for it very similar to an in-person visit, but there's just, like just a couple of things you need to consider too to prepare for your telemedicine visit. So the logistics, right? Ask your healthcare provider some tips and information, how to log in, how do you, how do you actually do this, um, how you make the telehealth appointment. And a lot of the times this telemedicine or telehealth visit serves as a substitute as your actual physical appointment. So there's a lot of time there is a copay involved um, and your insurance will be billed uh, likewise. Make sure you plan for your labs. Are they needed in advance? Budget for that. Do you need an order for your labs or a prescription? And then make sure you have the technology ready to go. Are you going to be using a smartphone or a tablet with a camera? We do prefer devices that have a camera so we can actually see you. It's amazing how much we can learn about the health of a patient by just laying eyes on them. And plan your location, just like they say in real estate. Location, location, location. Make sure you're in a quiet area. It's well lit. I can't tell you how many times I've done a telemedicine visit with my patient and they're driving in the car. It gives me such anxiety. I'm worried about their safety while they're driving. Please do not do a telemedicine visit while you're driving in the car. Make sure you're in a quiet, well-lit area sitting um, in, in your home or wherever you need to be and make sure you have a nice, strong Wi-Fi connection. If maybe if you're using your laptop, maybe plug that directly into your, your ethernet cord um, or make sure if you have a wireless situation, make sure your your tablet or whatever you're using is, is near to it so you have a good connection and you're not having a dropped call or a dropped visit with your provider that can interrupt the flow of the visit. And then if you have issues that maybe a rash that you need to show your provider, make sure you're, use, you're wearing accessible clothing so you may be able to show that part of your body to your provider. And then maybe you can collect some objective data for us, like vital signs. If you have a blood pressure cuff at home, check your blood pressure before the visit, write the number down, check your temperature. If you have a thermometer, write the number down. And you can even check your own heart rate, you know, by checking by your wrist or by your neck, count those beats per minute, write that number down and share those numbers with us. It will give us an idea of what's going on to know your vital signs. And if you don't have those supplies, you can pick them up at your local pharmacy. And at the end of the visit, please make sure you know kind of when your next visit is. Is it going to be an in-person visit or another virtual visit? Make sure you know what testing is going to be needed for your next visit. And of course, if there's any sort of medication refills that you need, make sure you get that as well. Now, the next slide is pretty important, and I'll give you a, a moment to digest this slide because this is talking about kind of activities that you may or may not be doing and how risky they are to expose yourself to the coronavirus on a scale of one to 10, kind of low risk to high risk. And this is taken from the Texas Medical Association for COVID-19 Task Force and their Committee on Infectious Disease. So you'll see in the kind of the green portion, it can be activities that are relatively benign, like opening your mail, all the way up to more risky activities, such as being in large crowds or large groups. And you'll see kind of the green area. These are relatively low risk. So you're either kind of doing these activities solo or you may just kind of one person farther away and you can maintain social distancing um, to the moderate where you now you may not be able to control the people who are around you, but maybe you're still able to have some sort of distance. Uh, that you can maintain to in the red zone where you're really unable to control the people around you and you may be in kind of closer situations just as indoor activities um, or attending events that have a large number of people. So take a look at the activities on this list. See if you've been relatively safe during this era and in this area or if you find yourself doing more riskier things than you thought and leaving yourself more risk for exposure to COVID-19. And if that is the case, consider changing some of your behavior to a more 
healthy lifestyle to minimize your risk and exposure. Now, some of these activities we really can't avoid, right? Like sitting in the waiting room for a doctor's appointment, but some things we may be, be able to consolidate the visits, or like I said, maybe telemedicine might be a great option. Now, in addition to some activities on this list, unfortunately, there are some particular groups in this country and even in the world who are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 infection, and that includes our minorities. And there's several factors that can contribute to the risk of COVID-19 in our minorities, including healthcare access, maybe lack of insurance or underinsurance for our minorities or difficulty with transportation or the only means of transportation is taking um, a bus or a train to work where you are around a lot of people. And technology. Studies have shown this year that in America and abroad, we are utilizing telemedicine more and more, but unfortunately we're reaching minorities less and less with this type of technology. Healthcare utilization, maybe there's um, difficulty with literacy or language barriers and trust. We cannot deny that there has been a history of marginalization of minorities in the history of healthcare in this country. And there can be a deep seated root of mistrust with healthcare providers because of this. And, and maybe our minorities are not going to their doctors because of this kind of mistrust. Occupation is a factor, right? A lot of people are essential workers and on the front lines and cannot help but being exposed to the virus just in their everyday job. Education, income and wealth gaps is real and, and, a, and a factor contributing to the increased risk of exposure for our minorities. Some people just cannot afford to miss work or they work more than one job and they cannot afford to miss either of them. And then of course, housing. Maybe people can't afford to crowded conditions or even homelessness is an issue. People can't afford to leave the crowded streets of their city or in their apartment building, or um, they don't have a second home to escape to than in the woods or on the beach and escape where COVID-19 where we might be very prominent in, in an urban setting. <clears throat> Some other disparities that, that we do see, like I said, we know that Black and Hispanic patients are less likely to have uh, telehealth visits. Black and Hispanic patients are more likely to have the COVID-19 infection. And when we look at Hispanic patients, they're more likely to have treatment delays. And when we look at minorities as a whole, they've actually time and time again during this pandemic have experienced more and more cancer disruptions in their care. And when we really boil down to it, when we look at the most significant risk factor for fatality amongst myeloma patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19, it's actually race and ethnicity. What's the best way to avoid COVID-19 and protect yourself? Well, we know that the virus spreads from person to person contact, mainly through respiratory droplets. And this can be respiratory droplets produced by coughing, sneezing, talking, and breathing. And more droplets are expelled with louder talking, yelling, and even singing. And we know close contact, and that's considered within six feet, really increases your risk of spread. These droplets can land in your mouth or in your nose um, of people who are nearby, or you can even inhale them into your lungs from people nearby. And remember, COVID-19 can be spread by people who are not demonstrating any symptoms at all, but are truly infected with the virus. It is less common to get the virus from a hard surface. It doesn't live as long really on hard surfaces. And that's why we say it's really important to wash your hands very often to avoid getting infected in that fashion. Maintain social distancing from people um, who don't live in your household or people who are sick in your household. And wearing a mask is so key, particularly in public and when around others who don't live in your household, you don't really know what those people are doing to maintain uh, their low risk of exposure. And particularly wear a mask when distancing is difficult to maintain. Please remember that a mask is not a substitute for social distancing. You really need to do both. Prevent other illnesses that can further your complication risk of COVID-19, such as get your annual flu vaccine and your pneumococcal vaccine if you are eligible for it or due for it. For it. Clean and dis disinfect frequently touched services like doorknobs and try and avoid travel as best you can. Cruises, um, flights, and make sure you choose activities outdoors as best as possible. We know a lot of spread is 
do to a lot of kind of indoor activities. So try your best to kind of move those activities outside if you can. And please protect others by wearing a mask in public and monitoring your own health. Check your temperature, check your symptoms. Do you have a cough? Um, do you have shortness of breath? Are you sneezing a lot? Do you have a change in or a lack of smell or taste? Make sure you're checking in with yourself to, to, that you're staying healthy. And if you aren't being, if you aren't feeling well and you are sick, quarantine. Stay home, stay away from others if you really think you are sick or if you've been exposed to those who are sick. Please pick a good mask, right? A good mask will work, a bad mask will not work. So we say, please pick a mask that has two or more layers of washable, breathable fabric. Make sure the mask completely covers your nose and your mouth. And make sure the mask fits snugly against the side of your face and doesn't have any gaps. And avoid masks that are made of fabric that's difficult to breathe through, such as vinyl. Or a mask that may have that exhalation valve or vent, that actually allows the virus to escape from your mask. And then please avoid using masks that are intended for our healthcare workers because we need these N95 respirators or surgical masks to protect ourselves when we're actively taking care of patients who are truly infected with the COVID-19 virus. Now, their jury is still out about some of these other forms of barriers, such as gaiters, which is basically like a scarf that kind of can cover your nose and mouth, um, or just wearing a face shield alone without a mask. We're not quite sure about the, the true effectiveness of these methods. And also some special considerations as well. So if you do wear glasses, make sure you find a mask that fits closely and snugly over your nose. So one that has kind of a, a wire fit inside so you can pinch it over your nose to limit the fogging of your glasses. And you can also use kind of that anti-fogging spray to prevent the fogging from happening to your mask. Masks only work if you wear it correctly, right? So please make sure you're wearing the mask over your nose and over your mouth because you're breathing through both your nose and your mouth. Wearing a mask around your neck, on your forehead, onto your nose, that is probably my biggest pet peeve when patients or people around are wearing masks just under their nose. That's not protecting you and that's not protecting others or even only under your nose and your mouth is exposed. Make sure you're not wearing it just under your chin, dangling from your ear on your arm. I know some of this may seem silly, but you'd be surprised how often I see people wearing masks in this fashion and it's really not protecting them or others. Now, what about the holiday season? A lot of patients are asking about this. And we know that we want to see our friends and family during the holiday season, but we might have to make some accommodations this year. Even the CDC says it's important to um, try and do these gatherings outside or do a virtual option for these gatherings. We know that the rising incidence of community spread is from what we consider safe contacts, our friends and family, but we don't truly know what they're doing outside of our household. I can tell you the rising cases in my area. Now, I practice at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, in the regional facility in New Jersey and um, the tri-state area, so New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, our area over here, we know that the rising cases are strictly stemming from indoor gatherings and carpooling. So it's important to know people that are being around, what are the precautions that they're taking? prior to the gathering and even during the gathering? Are they maintaining that social distancing? Are they wearing a mask? And virtual celebrations are in person with people in your household alone are probably the lowest risk activities you can do for the holiday season. Now, some things to consider if you are planning to celebrate with people from outside your household, where is the gathering gonna be? Is it indoors or outdoors? We know outdoors is, um, is a less risk. And how many people are gonna be there? Is it people gathering from several different households? Of course, that's gonna increase the risk. And where are people coming from and how are they traveling to your house? Are they coming by car? Are they coming by plane? Are they coming from a region that has a very high community spread? All of these factors we really need to consider. And people who should not be attending your holiday gathering are people who've been exposed to COVID-19 or infected with COVID-19 and those who are increased risk for severe illness should not be attending as well. We cannot deny that this has been a very stressful year. We never thought we'd be living through something like this. 
Stress during an infectious disease outbreak may sometimes cause a slew of symptoms and problems, such as fear and worry about your own health and the health of your loved ones. Fear and worry about your financial situation, potential job loss or loss of maybe support services that you truly rely on for your care. It can affect you by changes in your sleep patterns. You may have difficulty concentrating because of this stress or it's changing your eating patterns as well. It could be affecting or worsening your chronic health conditions or worsening your mental health state. And we can see increased usage of vices during this year due to the stress. People using tobacco products, um, vaping, maybe using alcohol or other substances and abusing these substances. So it's important to take care of your mental health. How do we do that? Avoid stressful activities as best you can. We all really want to know what's going on in the world by watching the news, but if that's really anxiety provoking for you, really causing a lot of stress, take a break from it. Take a break from watching the news or listening to the news or reading it. Um, watch things that are more enjoyable or, or read things that are more enjoyable. Maybe take up a new hobby and take care of your body, right? Take deep breaths, stretch like what we did earlier. Uh, meditation can be really helpful. Mindfulness is really helpful. There's meditation apps out there on your smartphone that are free, or you can even do online guided meditation uh, videos that are online that are no cost to. Like Dr. Cole said, it's important to eat a very healthy diet, a well-balanced diet as well, rich in fruits and vegetables, um, good proteins, exercise regularly, get plenty of good quality sleep, avoid excessive usage of alcohol and drug usage, of course. Make sure you budget time to unwind and relax and connect with others. You may not be able to physically see your loved ones or your, your family and your friends, but try and connect with them by by social media. Social distancing measures are in place. So consider connecting with people online and by phone or even by mail or email. You are not alone. The IMF, we are here to help you answer questions about COVID-19, about myeloma, your health. Don't forget that we're here to support you in a step of the way. And I'm happy to kind of comb through some of these questions and see if I can answer any questions. Well, we have, is the panel all, um, mics, are, are they all open, Amira? Yep. They are now? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of pull everyone back into the room as we uh, just, you know, put your imagination hat on. And they all have masks and they, they walked in the fresh air. 26 miles to a camera, and they seem pretty healthy. I'm a little concerned about Craig's drinking. I'm kidding, but he's a good guy here. Let's have, I, I got one question yep. from a, a, a patient asking, what patients would not be eligible for a CAR T therapy? Would not be. Craig. Uh, Craig, do you want to take that one, or you want me to answer? Um. Well, it's probably both. Um, you know, um, <laughs> the thing is, is that, um, you know, the initial clinical trials were very limited because of concern um, over the toxicity, um, especially the cytokine release syndrome. And so when these trials were first um, initiated, uh, especially for lymphomas and leukemias, it was pretty res restrictive. But now we that's actually opened up quite a bit, um, and so with and because the CAR T is currently um, still in clinical trials, there are restrictions based on the product of what of what a person would be eligible for a particular CAR T therapy. But in in kind of the broadest sweeps, you know, patients that don't have a lot of other, you know comorbid conditions, you know, meaning, you know, someone that's had, you know, repeated heart attacks or congestive heart failure, seizure disorders um, are, uh, could be excluded. Um, and, uh, and age is not a, uh, a discriminator for CAR-T as, uh, except for under 18. Um, but, um, uh, but really it is a com uh, comorbidities. Um, and that's going to be changing in the next several years as we get more experience with the myeloma CAR-T uh, products um, in the same way with a lot of other therapies that we expand 
the eligibility. But I guess the short answer would be because they're under clinical trials, it really would be the eligibility would be based on that particular clinical trial. Fantastic yeah. response. Uh, Dr. Panner? Yeah, I think it's a very thorough response. I, I, I entirely agree with that. For the time being, you have to meet those eligibility criteria. You know, I will add that currently patients who have been on other anti-BCMA therapies are usually excluded from those trials. And likely when it gets FDA approved, um, it will have that restriction. But from scientific perspective, um, the rationale maybe is not so strong, and that may change in the future. Yeah. Would you agree, Dr. Cole? Yes, that absolutely. If you've been on Balantamab, then for the time being, you may not be, uh, you may no longer be eligible for CAR T cells, but not necessarily that that will be ca the case a few years later. Amy, have you been involved in anything with the CAR T programs? Uh, yes, I've had a, a couple of our patients receive CAR T therapy. I was actually going to say the same exact thing as Dr. Panier. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the trials may exclude patients who've received maybe anti-BCMA therapy already if it's a BCMA-directed CAR T cell product. Um, but I've, I've had patients receive CAR T cell therapy, respond beautifully. Um, but just like Dr. Cole said, every clinical trial has eligibility criteria and exclusion criteria. And every trial is different. So it's really important to kind of go over the specific eligibility criteria to see um, if that CAR T cell trial is for you. Fantastic. Um, are you, is it a big number of patients you're seeing or are it not, it's like two to five or is there 20 people doing it for your institution? Me specifically? Yeah, Amy, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. We try and move to CAR T if we for eligible patients. Um, we do only do CAR T cell therapy at our main campus facility. And we've had a lot of patients who have been living with myeloma for a long time, relapse refractory. So we do have a, a good amount of patients who receive CAR, CAR T therapy. So I, I would say definitely more than five. <laughs> That's fantastic. Maybe more and like doctors. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So. This is this has really become something that I, I had no idea those were the numbers. All right, a patient has used Revdex for relapse. They will start RD in January. Should they consider adding DARA? Doctor? Um, I, I would I would say yes. Um, and it depends on if they had um, if they had you know received um, DARA um, in the past and. You know, and everyone's different. Um, you know, the the one thing that we've seen over the years is that there have been a number of clinical trials, lots of clinical trials that have compared two drugs versus three drugs uh, for multiple my for relapsed myeloma and for our front myeloma, and basically, or I should say, uniformly, uh, two drugs um, have lost two three drug therapies. The only caveat to that have been really the, the, the super novel therapies like CAR-T and the BCMA-directed therapies um, that have come up recently. But when you look at relevant-based uh, therapies, um, three drugs always wins. And so when I treat, unless there's a, a specific clinical trial or a specific reason why a patient can't receive or decides not to receive three drugs, I always recommend uh, three drugs. And then a good question is, is for relapse myeloma, is uh, is four drugs better than three drugs? Um, and that's, again, you know, a very, uh, is very hot area of investigation. My. Uh, and again, Dr. Panner, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree that if possible, uh, uh, three drug regimen is preferred because you'll have better chance of responding and stay in remission longer with three drugs as opposed to only two. Now, having said that, it's important also to uh, pick a patient who can tolerate three drugs. So, for example, there are two is contraindicated in patients with uh, very severe COPD. You know, so not knowing your specific situation, you know, your comorbidities and 
uh, reasoning. It's hard to give um, a specific answer to that one, but I think it's important to ask that question your uh, treating physician. You okay, know, that's yeah, that's important. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we've given you all out. And thank you, doctors, and thank you, Amy. Um, hopefully we have given you guys enough information out there to go, hmm, maybe I need to do some more work on myself with respect to myeloma. Or you'll get the question that you are, you know, you seem like you're doing well with myeloma and this only confirms it. That's fantastic, too. I want to say that finally here that the IMF has been in operation for 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary this year. And we've been providing educational materials to all sorts of people dealing with myeloma. We are the number one source for educational materials. We invite you to come into our world at myeloma.org or at our info line at 800-452-2873. Now, uh, the info line, you can leave a message at any time. Uh, they'll get the messages the next day. So if, you have a, a, if you're up on steroids and you want to ask a question, the phone number's there. And those of you that are on steroids, remember to remove the rugs. Don't be mean to your spouse or friends. And have a donut or two. You'll love them. I, uh, Krispy Kremes are one of my favorite donuts. Now, with that being said, I, they moved the slide on me and tell you about that this will be on our website. That's a long uh, URL there. For those of you who attended today, you'll get that in an email in a couple of days so you can go back and look at your notes and look at your presentations. My next slide I want to show is, again, I want to thank our sponsors, Amgen, Janssen, Binding Site, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Care Farm, and Takeda Oncology. Without their generous uh, donations to us, we would not be able to perform such great programs that we do. Finally, you were at a regional community workshop today. You were one of 400 people in the past workshops that have had this opportunity I certainly hope that you found it uh, comforting and a successful interaction with you. You must understand virtual is not the same as being in person, but hopefully next year we can start traveling to your town and getting these workshops there. And finally, stay with me for just a couple more minutes. I'd like you to watch a video we put together about the foundation, and you'll learn a little more, uh, uh, little more information about the foundation. And with that being said, thank you. When a patient is diagnosed with myeloma, they're not alone. They have support, they have information, they have access to things that were not there in the past. After seeing the ravages that myeloma can cause, since then, it's just been a mission to not have other people have to go through and suffer what he did. There was a desperate need to provide information that could lead them to the best tests and to the best treatment. It was just giving patients the voice. We needed new treatments, better treatments. Could we cure myeloma, prevent myeloma? Sometimes a very big advance can make only if you take a risk. Look what happened in the survival of patients when the IMF started and now 30 years later. They achieved so many things in these 30 years. The focus, the energy, uh, the synergy. It is almost impossible to believe what has happened over the last 30 years. The outcomes are dramatically improved and they're going to improve more. Because we believe that we can work collaboratively and we will cure this disease once and for all.